Yeah, good day, guys. Um, Milos, uh, how's it back, being back in, in the US and back in camp, and what do you make of the Mexico Challenge? Um, yeah, it's it's really cool to be back here in the States. You know, I think it's a it's a great place. Um, I think in general, it's it's really good to be here, especially in the lead up to the next World Cup in two and a half years. And you know, I think uh, the US is going to push football a lot more now and, and invest a lot more in that. And the game's going to grow here. And I think having played in the MLS, you know, the facilities and, and the clubs, what they have is unreal. I think it's second to none. And I think it's only going to get better. So I think it's really good to be here. Um, I think it's, it, for me personally, it's fun to be here because I really enjoyed my time here. And I, I think uh, I think all of us enjoy enjoy being here at the moment. And yeah, it's obviously an honor to be back in camp. You know, I missed the last camp uh, against Argentina in China, but it's really good to be here. And I, I love always coming to the Socceroos. It's an honor, it's a privilege. It's one of the nicest things you could do as a footballer is represent your country. And yeah, just looking forward to, to the next few days. And the newcomer at the back, Cameron Burgess, um, what do you make of him? Oh, mate, I've only seen him in, in a couple of sessions. I think, to be honest, he's a really good good, good player, good person, um, fits in well in the group. Um, obviously, he's got a fair bit of experience. Um, so I think he fits in well. Uh, obviously, I believe he'll get his chance on, on Saturday and we'll see how that goes. And again, it's up to the coaching staff to decide onwards and, and hopefully he he proves himself and, and does well and, and, and stays here as, as long as possible. And, you know, I think it's a privilege for him as well to be here. And, uh, you know, we're obviously doing our best to make all the new boys and the young players and, and the players who are here their first time to, to make him feel as comfortable as possible and to make him realise that this is a family environment and to make him realise that this is, you know, I think this is the most special thing in your career is to represent your country. <coughs> Thanks, Vince. Uh, Vince? Thanks. Hey, Milos. Um, hey, mate. Keen to talk more about the MLS with you. Um, it seems to have gone to another level, I think, even since you were there, uh, with, with Messi coming to, to Miami and things just absolutely exploding off the back of that. Yeah. Um, does that surprise you, first of all? And then, second of all, can you just explain a little bit more to people who don't understand MLS, like exactly what they're doing from your perspective that you've seen that, that makes this league... Uh, so important for football in the next few years, as you mentioned. Look, I, I, you know, I think it was expected to grow, and I think it was expected to be like a big boom when he came. But the fact that he came, and then Busquets came, Jordi Alba came, you know, these are these are big names. You've had some guys under the radar, you know, like Maya Yoshida went to LA Galaxy. You know, some some big players have have moved in and around the league that 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 are you know of high quality and and of really good level, international level. But what he's done, he's obviously made Inter Miami the most popular thing in, in the planet at the moment. I think most popular sporting team around. Um, but the games changed completely. You know, like now you see tickets are like, just for a single game, like seven, 800 bucks a ticket, which is unreal. But not just the financial side. I think he's elevated the fact that kids nowadays are looking at football. They're not looking at the NFL, not looking at the NHL, baseball. They're looking at football and wanting to be like, oh, let's go watch football, let's go watch Messi, let's go watch these games, and not just him, but they're going around and watching all the other games in all the other stadiums, which is credit to the MLS for doing that. Um, how they done that deal, um, what's included in that deal, I don't know. It wasn't part of the conversations. <laughs> but I'm sure it's a really, really good deal for him. But I think the MLS over the next couple of years will do something different. I think the budgets have to change. I think the, the rules with the DPs and, and having three players outside the, the salary, uh, I guess, cap, they have to change. I think they're going to have to expand that a lot more, invest a lot more in players if you're wanting the quality to be even higher. Um, the training facilities are second to none. Stadiums are unreal. Football's good. The travel's easy now because charter, charter planes uh, are a thing now and you know, you're in and out before the game and after the game. Uh, I also think the quality of football is really good. I think there's players that make differences in every team and as you see on the ladder, it's very tight. As you see in every game, it's 3-2, three, 4-3, three, 2-0. Two, three, two there's a lot of goals. Uh, it's very interesting to watch. Open football, very good attacking players. 
And I think over the next couple of years, it's going gonna, it's gonna to grow. It's not going in that direction where what Saudi Arabia has done, where they've invested a lot of money and brought in all the biggest players in the world. I don't think they have that mentality here. But I think over the next couple of years, I think it's going to be a, a very strong league. And just in terms of that, um, do you expect what MLS is doing to bleed through all football in that part of the world over the next few years? I mean, like, you're not playing Messi or even the US in this friendly, but you're at a big stadium against Mexico, which is now starting to play sort of cross-league stuff with MLS. Mm. It should be a big crowd there. Do you just see that part of the world where you used to play just on an upward trajectory uh, outside of MLS too? I do. I think um, I think it's going upwards. I think it's going in the right direction. I think the salaries in, in the Liga MX in Mexico are a lot higher than what they are in the MLS. I think um, the fact that Mexico play two or three games a year here in, in, in Dallas is unreal as well because they've got a good following here. I think what MLS and Liga MX done, this League's Cup now, where they've kind of mixed two leagues and, and had a tournament, I think that's unreal. And I think the MLS, obviously, it's not going to be as big as the Argentinian and Brazilian League in this part of the world, but it's going to be, it's going to be a very important player, I guess, if I can say player in the world of football over the next couple of years, I think. Thanks, Vince. Uh, Joey? Cool. Cheers. Um, thanks for taking the time today, Milos. No um, worries, Maybe mate. just following up on um, what Vince talked about. You were at the Columbus crew, obviously one of the, the smaller market sides in the MLS, and there's a ton of attention on Miami and LAFC and the Galaxy and the Red Bulls and all that. How do you think the MLS can go about, you know, bringing attention onto the the Columbuses of the world, the Nashvilles, these smaller market teams in the MLS? Um, it's, it's a good question, mate. I think that's, that's one for, I guess, the, the general managers, the presidents and the financial teams to do because, you know, obviously money will attract players. You can't tell me that that's not the case in, in Saudi Arabia in, in, in those moments. But again, players have to look out for their families. Um, and their futures. So I think what you can do in the MLS is obviously it's more attractive to be in Miami, it's more attractive to be in LA, Chicago, Philadelphia, New York, um, Dallas here. You know, it's more attractive to be here than it is in Cincinnati, maybe Columbus, maybe, I don't know, Colorado. But then these clubs that are from the less attractive cities will probably have to invest a little bit more to attract players to come in, you know, because they don't get that lifestyle. But then the flip side of it is life is a lot cheaper in Columbus than what it is in New York and Miami and LA. So there's pros and cons to it. And also wanted to ask, mate, after the Ecuador games, you talked about the squad getting a bit of an education, that South American school and how the Ecuadorians sort of dominated that game a little bit with their mentality. Coming up against Mexico now, there and especially the Mexican fan base in the stands, that's another sort of educational opportunity, I guess, for the squad, that experience, what lessons are you hoping that the, the boys can take from this kind of atmosphere and this kind of opponent? Look, I think, um, you know, after that Ecuador game, I think uh, we lacked a little bit of that street knowledge. I think we looked at that, learned from it. This game will be different. There'll be probably 60, 70,000 uh, Mexican supporters in the stadium. And, you know, I think it's going to be very important that we shut ourselves out from the stadium and just focus on the football. Uh, I think it's very important that we go through these games as a learning curve, but also as a challenge to see how far we've come and what we can do to kind of play our role in the world of football where we come up against teams where stadiums are going to be all against us. So that we get used to these moments, get used to playing these games because we don't want to be just participating in these games and then coming out and saying, oh, it was difficult, they had 70,000 fans, this and that. No, it's not what football is. you got to go implement your game. Don't worry about the crowd. Learn from our mistakes, what we've done in the past, and to be better in, in, in this game on Saturday. I think you know we've touched up on, on all these things that you've mentioned over the last couple of days, and I'm sure that the boys will be ready for, for the game on Saturday. Thanks, Joey. Tom? Hey, Milos. Um, I just wanted to uh, have a chat about your current club situation. It's been a it's been a decent start to the season, but obviously the fans don't accept anything but the best. So slipping to second, there's a little bit of pressure there. Plus, also the small matter of a, 
a game with, with Manchester City in a couple of weeks. It's, um, it, it's quite intense times for you. Yeah, um, I guess the club doesn't accept, no, not, not I guess, I know the club doesn't expect, accept losing games and, and we should not allow ourselves to lose games in, in the domestic league. Um, you know, it was obviously a slip up two weeks ago, which we, we shouldn't allow ourselves to do that, but we'll bounce back and I'm sure we'll turn things around and, and, and things will be in our favour come later on in the season. Obviously, tough draw for the Champions League, but one that we're looking forward to, obviously playing against the champions of Europe, best team in Europe at the moment. It's going to be a, it's going to be a hell of a challenge, but it's exciting times for the club in general. It's exciting times for all of us as players, and it's exciting times for, for myself personally to come up against the best team in Europe, probably the best team in the world, to be fair. Um, it's going to be a hell of a game and you know it's one of those games where we as a club and as people we won't take a backward step obviously we're not going to go head first but we need to be intelligent but we're not going to go in and and i guess you know just sit back and wait for them to do what they want to do was presumably games like this is one of the reasons why you, you headed yeah. back to belgrade yeah i think that was one of the main reasons why i headed back was games like this and and obviously being able to push the season into December to give myself the best chances to be fit and healthy for the Asian Cup in January. Um, that also had a role to play in it. You know, I had a few conversations with Arnie and the club, uh, Red Star obviously wanted me to come back. And, you know, I took the opportunity with both hands, um, knowing that my family is there and, and my wife's family and you know, she feels quite comfortable there. So we've got two kids now and we have to look at those things as well. Thanks, Tom. Marco? Yeah, Neil, I was just wondering, I'm right. just on that. So, like, each time that you've left, you know, Red Star, have they always said to you, mate, you know, whenever you want, we'd like you to come back in the uh, future? Um, they've, every time I've left, they've always said the door's always open for you, which is very rare in the world of football now that once you leave a club that the door's open, unless you leave on good terms. And I've obviously left on good terms, but not just that. I think I've, I've played well every time I've been there, so that obviously keeps the door open. and. Yeah, um, they called, I answered, and things went quite quick, to be honest. And mate, in the soccer is that what are you, 29, 30 now? Where do you see yourself in terms 29, of... Uh, mate. <laughs> <laughs> 29, mate. 29, mate. Do you see as a, as a senior member of the squad, like, you know, 29, you've been around for a while, but you're still only, you know, 29. Where do you see yourself in that, uh, you know, defensive pecking order and, the, you know, your, the sort of... Um, I guess, you know, I guess, um, experience you can Say what you want, mate. Younger. Say say what you want. I won't get offended, mate. You can say I'm, I'm the grandpa of the <laughs> team. I don't mind. Nah, look, um, I'm happy to be here, mate. I'm 29. I've still got, a, I hope, another seven or eight years of good football. Um, hoping to go to this World Cup, and then I'm hoping to go to 2030. Um, obviously, if the body holds, and, and obviously, if the coaches want me to do that, and I'm playing at a good level. But, uh, look... I love being here, mate. I, I really enjoy my time being here. And I think the boys love having me around. I don't want to talk myself up, but I think the people enjoy having me here because I'm a little bit of a different character. I've got my moments where I, where I have fun and then I've got my moments when I'm serious. And I think Arnie, Arnie knows that and he sees that. And, you know, I do my best to, to coach around the younger players. Uh, in terms of your question about the picking order, uh, I don't think there's a picking order here. I think it's the coach chooses who he, he thinks is is best available for the day, um, whether it's friendlies like this or qualifiers or big games. You know, I think sometimes, you know, players who haven't been in in some of these friendlies will get a chance to play so that obviously Arnie can see whether he can count on them or not. He knows what he can get from me, what he gets from me. So, I, you know, whether I play, I don't play, I don't know, but I'm obviously 100% committed to the cause whether I do or don't play. So I think the picking order is the question for, for Arnie, not for me. Thanks, no worries, mate. Tom, back to you. And guys, any further questions after Tom just raised his hand? I'm just um, interested. I mean, she posted some, some stuff after the World Cup. It was obviously a very emotional experience for you. But I just wonder whether, as the dust settled, it sort of made you realise the level you could play at. And, the, you know, with all due respect to the rise of the MLS, playing, going back to play for Red Star is, against Manchester City is a significant step up from almost any other league. Did, did the World Cup make you think you know what, I should be trying to play at the very highest level I can? Um, it did make me think, mate, and you know, I've, 
I've had these conversations with myself in the mirror a fair few times, mate, and with people around that, you know, I think I haven't had the best treatment uh, in my career. I think in my career I could have been at a lot, I guess, in, in better leagues, uh, playing better football. I haven't had the luck or, 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 or the support from agents or the deals haven't happened, but I believe I could have been playing in Italy, Spain, Germany, England, wherever it be, but I haven't had that luck and fortune like many others have. But, you know, I've never quit. I've never, you know, let that affect me as much. You know, I've, wherever I've played, I've given my best. I've left my heart on the pitch. But I've seen myself and I've seen, you know, what I can do. And I'm not saying I could be playing for, for Arsenal or Man City, but I know I could be playing at, at, at a club that's, you know, in and around the mixed mid-table club in one of the top five leagues in the world. Um, I haven't had the luck and fortune to do so. You know, I've said many times when I've gotten the phone to agents, to clubs, I've said, look, I'm, I'm more than happy to come play half a year for free. I don't need to get paid. I just want to show what I can do. And then if you're happy with what I can do, I'm more than happy to, to take any contract you can give me on the table because, you know, I just want to give myself the chance to be able to play in the top five leagues in the world. And, you know, I, I said to myself that that's a, that's a dream of mine to do. And, you know, I don't want to look back 10 years now and, and you know, finishing my career and, being able to say oh, I haven't played in the top five leagues in the world, I think I would let myself down if that happens. But we'll see. I've still got time, and you know I'm going to keep chipping away, and hopefully one day it happens that that call comes in that I could could go to a, a, a club in the top five leagues. Joey, cool. um, Milos, I wanted to. You were talking about your place in the team a bit earlier. From my understanding, you've been playing centre back um, in Belgrade, but the last times you played. For the Socceroos, you've been playing it as a right back. Have you been given any indication by Arnie? Like, are you just a right back now in his mind, or what's the go? Uh, no, I haven't spoken to him about that. He, as I said, no, you know, he he knows what he can get from me at right back, at, at as a central defender in the back three or a back four. He knows what he can get from what he can get from me. So I think it's a it's a question for him and and the staff where they see me. You know, I. You know, maybe in the near future he might see me just standing next to him on the touchline and shouting and getting information and instructions. <laughs> Any, uh, anything else, guys? We might, uh, we might call it there. I've got one. I mean, Los, I guess that uh, versatility, you know, that's always handy, isn't it, in terms of, uh, you know, the national team? Or well, like any team, I guess. Yeah, it is. It is very handy when you can play more positions. You know, the more positions, the merrier. And, you know, the more positions you, you play, the more money you get. I'm kidding. Uh, I don't get double the salary if I play two or three positions. No, it's, it's obviously helpful. You know, it helps when you can play two positions or three or four. Um, it helps the coaches, it helps myself as well, the chance to, to get on the pitch.